Hey everyone, Adam Simmons here from DGTL Infra, short for Digital Infrastructure. Boingo Wireless, which trades on the NASDAQ under the ticker WIFI, is up for sale. And it gave investors some strong assurances on its Q3 2020 earnings call that it is putting the best interest of stockholders first. In this video, I'm going to give you a quick overview of Boingo Wireless, what the company does, an update on some recent and telling disclosures from its Q3 2020 earnings report, a brief snapshot of its valuation, and discuss who the potential buyers of Boingo could be. You might actually be able to make some money off of Boingo's imminent potential sale because the company is publicly traded under the ticker WIFI. So stay tuned, and I will break this all down for you. Before I do, be sure to subscribe to the DGTL Infra channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss my next in-depth video that is coming out soon. Now, let's jump into the video. So starting with an overview of Boingo Wireless. Boingo acquires long-term wireless rights at large venues like airports, transportation hubs, stadiums and arenas, military bases, multifamily properties, universities, convention centers, and office campuses. Boingo then builds high-quality wireless networks such as distributed antenna systems, known as DAS, D-A-S, Wi-Fi, and small cells at those venues. Boingo then works to monetize the wireless networks through a number of different products and services it has. So Boingo operates 73 distributed antenna systems, known as DAS networks, containing 40,800 DAS nodes, which you can see at the bottom of the page. In addition, the company has 11,600 DAS nodes in backlog. So together, this makes Boingo the largest operator of indoor distributed antenna systems, or DAS networks, in the world. And when we think about digital infrastructure, this is that fourth vertical of digital infrastructure, which we haven't touched much on because Boingo is one of the largest companies, but also includes towers, data centers, fiber, and the small cell and DAS fourth vertical, which Boingo falls into. Boingo also has a Wi-Fi network business, which you may be more familiar with from a consumer-facing perspective because Boingo has over 1.3 million commercial Wi-Fi hotspots in more than 100 countries around the world. These are hotspots in locations like airports or cafes where you can either have free internet Wi-Fi or pay for premium service through Boingo. So if we think about the revenue model for Boingo, we'll break it into two different segments. First is business to business, and then second is business to consumer. In business to business, the end customers for Boingo are the carriers. So think about AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. So the business to business segment is broken down into three main subsegments. First is distributed antenna systems, or DAS, and that's combined with small cells. Then second is multifamily, and third is wholesale Wi-Fi. So DAS and small cells is the first subsegment within business to business, and Boingo generates revenue here from telecom operators that pay build-out fees and recurring access fees so that cellular customers may use Boingo's DAS or small cell networks at locations where the company manages and operates the wireless network. In the second subsegment, multifamily, Revenue is generated driven primarily by property owners who purchase network installation services and recurring monthly Wi-Fi services and support from Boingo. Finally, the third subsegment within business to business is wholesale Wi-Fi. And here, customers such as telecom operators, cable companies, technology companies, and enterprise software companies pay Boingo usage-based Wi-Fi network access and software licensing fees to allow their customers access to Boingo's footprint worldwide. So those three subsegments represent the business to business verticals of Boingo. Now moving to the business to consumer segment, it's really comprised of three further subsegments. First being military, which you see in the top middle part of the page. Second being retail, which you see on the top right part of the page. And third being advertising. And so we'll start with the military subsegment. 
So Boingo generates revenue here by military personnel who purchase Wi-Fi services on site at military bases. And as of Q3 2020, Boingo had 136,000 military subscribers at the different bases. The second subsegment within business to consumer is the retail segment, and revenue here is driven by consumers who purchase a monthly subscription plan or one time Wi Fi access fees. So think of this as if you're purchasing a one time access fee to Boingo at the airport or at a cafe, or you can subscribe on a recurring basis so you don't have to pay each time you go to one of those venues. Boingo's retail subscriber base was about 49,000 at the end of Q3 2020. And you can see that it has declined materially over the past few quarters, previously being as high as 85,000 subscribers. And that's primarily because of the COVID situation, where people are not traveling through these venues like an airport or going to cafes as frequently as they did before. Nevertheless, the retail segment is quite a small aspect of Buengo's business, and thus this decline is not affecting it that materially. The final subsegment within the business to consumer segment for Boingo is called advertising. And here revenue is generated from advertisers that seek to reach consumers via sponsored Wi-Fi access. And this again is quite a small segment, so we won't go into much detail about this. But the real takeaway about Boingo is that across all of its businesses, including distributed antenna systems, multifamily, and military, which are some of the largest businesses for Boingo, approximately 95% of the company's revenues are either contractual or recurring in nature so quite secure and predictable revenue streams. And if we pick out a few examples of who these customers are, so for example, AT&T accounts for about 12% of Boingo's revenue, Verizon accounts for 11% of Boingo's total revenue, and T-Mobile, now that it has combined with Sprint, accounts for approximately 23% of Boingo's revenue. So three high quality customers, making up a substantial portion of Boingo's revenue, which are similar customers in nature to the tower companies, which we'll speak about later. So now that we understand Boingo's business model, let's get into the interesting part and talk about what the situation is of Boingo being for sale. So Bloomberg reported in February of 2020 that Boingo Wireless is, quote, exploring a potential sale after receiving takeover interest and is, quote, working with an advisor to explore its options and field potential offers. Finally, the article goes on to say that, that, quote, Boingo could attract private equity firms, infrastructure funds, or strategic buyers. And we'll talk about all three of those buyer groups further along in the video. So in March 2020, Boingo disclosed that it had received multiple inquiries regarding a potential strategic transaction and that its board had engaged advisors to assess these opportunities. With the market volatility occurring in March, Boingo paused the sales process for a couple months, but has recently disclosed that it is making significant progress, and as of Q3 2020 earnings, it seems that a potential transaction is rather imminent. So since February 24th, when those initial reports were released, the stock has traded down from the $14.25 per share stock price to $12.73 per share as of yesterday's close, an 11% decline. However, this includes the fact that the stock has experienced recent strength since October 26, 2020, when it traded as low as $8.76 per share. So over the past 13 trading sessions, the stock is up 45%, given the increased likelihood that the company will now imminently be sold. So in Q3 2020, Boingo announced several notable customer wins during the quarter, including a long-term agreement with San Diego State University for a distributed antenna systems network at its football stadium. Additionally, Boingo is implementing a Wi-Fi 6 network which is the newest version of Wi-Fi, at Sao Paulo International Airport in Brazil. Further, Boingo has 65 DAS venues and 11,600 DAS nodes in its backlog, providing the company with a strong runway for 2021 growth. Further, management was also positive on its emerging tower business and demand from carriers to join cell sites on military bases. 
Finally, the company has an attractive long-term pipeline with over 25,000 potential distributed antenna systems venues, and the total addressable market for this is quite large and at the same time underpenetrated. So with that operational update in mind, let's move on to some of the specific transaction-related commentary and disclosures that Boingo made in its Q3 2020 earnings call. So first, Michael Finley, the chief executive officer of Boingo, stated, There continues to be strong interest and engagement from multiple parties. And based upon that, we continue to run the strategic review process to evaluate opportunities that we believe would be in the best interest of our stockholders. Peter Hovenier, chief financial officer, went on to say, We are continuing to engage with multiple interested parties regarding a potential strategic transaction as announced and discussed in prior earnings calls. Additionally, an analyst asked Boingo's CFO on the earnings call, do you have a formal book out? And if so, when did you put it out there? What the analyst is asking is whether there is confidential information in the market being used as marketing materials in order to sell Boingo as a business. And Boingo's chief financial officer, Peter Hovenier, responded saying, Yes, we engaged a strategic advisor to advise the company and our board, and yes, they've been engaging with parties, and there's information out there with parties who are under an NDA, or non-disclosure agreement. The final clue, or piece of information, which was disclosed by Boingo through its Q3 2020 10Q filing, which is their quarterly report, is within their disclosure for the reconciliation of net loss attributable to common stockholders to adjusted EBITDA. And you can see this on the bottom half of the page. Within this disclosure, if we look at the first column and the third column, so for the three months ended September 30th, 2020, and for the nine months ended September 30th, 2020, Boingo has disclosed a line item called transaction costs. And so as you can see in that third column, for the nine months ended September 30th, 2020, Boingo has taken $1.2 million of transaction costs, including another $121,000 taken during the third quarter of 2020. So although some may consider this an incremental expense making the business less profitable, it is in fact a positive sign of the sales process. By Boingo accruing for these transaction costs, it is an indication that the company believes it is likely to have to pay them. And how transaction costs typically work is that it is likely that the company will have to pay them once the transaction is announced. So Boingo is accruing for these expenses, knowing that it will likely incur them in cash in the future. So this page really shows on the left side what some of the key Wall Street analysts think the valuation for Boingo is and their specific price targets for Boingo, which are usually keyed off of the year-end, so by year-end 2020. And out of the seven analysts that disclose a specific stock price for Boingo, the range of price targets is between a low of $15 per share from Oppenheimer and a high of $23 per share from Roth Capital Partners with generally most analysts being at a price of $18 per share or above. So I'll take one excerpt from a report by Oppenheimer analyst Timothy Horan, who upgraded Boingo from perform to outperform and put a $15 price target on the stock as of October 26th. I'll link to an article below as well, which discusses his commentary. Horan states that, we believe there is a high probability Boingo sells part or all of its business to Towers or an infrastructure-focused private equity firm in the next year. A strategic buyer could improve EBITDA by $15 million on unnecessary overhead expenses alone. Plus, there's a strong appetite for wireless infrastructure shown by multiple recent transactions. Just as a reference point to Oppenheimer and all of these other analysts' price targets, Boingo's current stock price, as seen from the table on the right side of the page, was $12.73 per share as of yesterday's close. So now let's walk through some of the key metrics on the right side of the page so we can understand how Boingo is valued. So moving to the right side of the page and starting with the left column, 
the share price for Boingo as of yesterday's close was $12.73 per share. Boingo currently has 44,500,000 shares outstanding, and therefore the company's market capitalization is $567 million. Including the net debt for Boingo, which is specifically gross debt plus some non-controlling interests, less cash, that figure is $117 million and brings Boingo's enterprise value to $684 million at its current state. So moving down and discussing a couple operational and financial metrics, as of Q3 2020, Boingo had 73 DAS networks or venues online. Additionally, the company had 40,800 DAS nodes. And in terms of its military business, the company had 136,000 military subscribers. In terms of financials, the estimated revenue that the company will generate for 2020 is approximately $235 million. In terms of EBITDA, the estimate for 2020 is about $82.5 million. And this equates to an EBITDA margin of about 35%. So therefore, if we take the enterprise value of $684 million and divide it by the EBITDA estimate for 2020, Boingo is currently trading at a multiple of 8.3 times EBITDA, as seen on the bottom part of the table. Now without going through the low estimate or high estimate column in specific detail, it's worth just summarizing at the bottom that in order to hit the low-end Oppenheimer estimate for Boingo in terms of valuation, the company needs to be trading at a 9.8 times EBITDA multiple, which is approximately an 18% upside to the current stock price that Boingo is trading at. If Boingo were to achieve the high end of analyst estimates, which is $23 per share, that would equate to an EBITDA multiple of about 13 and a half times. And if the stock price were to respond to this, that is about an 81% upside to Boingo's current trading values. So with those metrics in mind, it is relevant to compare Boingo to other digital infrastructure companies in order to get a sense of whether the valuations are realistic. And the reason why we're not comparing Boingo to other publicly traded small cell and DAS companies is because there really aren't any that are publicly traded currently. So we have to look to other digital infrastructure companies, namely being the other three sectors of digital infrastructure. Those companies are in the tower sector, the data center sector, and the fiber sector. So if we start with the tower sector, American Tower, Crown Castle, and SBA Communications are currently trading between 25 times to 30 times EBITDA for 2020. So a material premium to any estimate of Boingo's trading value. If we look to data centers, Equinix, Digital Realty, CoreSight, Cyrus One, and QTS, are currently trading between 24 times and 30 times EBITDA for 2020. Again, a significant premium to any of the valuations applied to Boingo. Finally, fiber companies are currently trading in a range between 12 times and 16 times EBITDA, which is taken from some public comps and also recent precedent transactions like Zao. Therefore, not only does Boingo trade at a material discount to all other sectors of digital infrastructure, but it has many of the same customers on long-term contracts as those other digital infrastructure companies do. So if we recall, Boingo's customers include AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile, and these are some of the same largest customers for companies like American Tower and Crown Castle. And given the valuation disconnect in terms of multiples, Boingo could be an accretive acquisition opportunity to those very same digital infrastructure companies, particularly tower companies, which we'll discuss now. So on this page, we show who the potential buyers for Boingo Wireless could be. And this is not a case where some of these companies have said they would potentially buy Boingo, but rather other investors in digital infrastructure who have acquired similar companies or companies in adjacent verticals like towers and data centers in the past. The grouping of the potential buyers are in four different quadrants. So first are strategics, which are mainly the tower companies. Second are the infrastructure funds. Third are more traditional private equity funds. And fourth are pension or sovereign wealth funds. 
So let's touch on very briefly about some of these buyers and why they could potentially be the suitor for Boingo Wireless. So starting with the Strategics or Tower Companies. This group, as mentioned before, shares the same key customer base as Boingo. Specifically, AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile are all top customers for the tower companies. So having that same customer overlap and relationship allows these buyers to do even more business with those customers once Boingo is part of their offering. Additionally, American Tower already has one of the largest distributed antenna systems businesses across the United States, making Boingo a key complement if it were to be acquired by them. Crown Castle, on the other hand, has one of the largest small cell businesses in the United States and is currently deploying about 50% in terms of market share of new small cell nodes going online. SBA Communications is less likely of a buyer given that they owned a similar business in the past called Extanet, which they sold their interest in a few years ago. Therefore, it's unlikely that they would re enter the business with an acquisition of Boingo now. Moving to the second quadrant, the infrastructure funds, this grouping of names were specifically mentioned in the Bloomberg article. So the first potential buyer is Colony Capital, who we've made a couple other videos about, which I'll link to above and below in case you want to check out and know more about them. But with Colony Capital, they own a business called Extanet, which is one of Boingo's closest competitors. It's currently private, but Extanet operates 31,000 small cell nodes, 600 CRAN hubs, 4,000 owned fiber route miles, and 16,000 leased fiber route miles across the United States. The combination of Boingo and Extanet could create a materially more powerful company in the distributed antenna systems and small cell space once merged. The second infrastructure fund just below is Stone Peak Infrastructure, and they also own an interest in Extanet, so they could partner with Colony Capital on the acquisition of Boingo. If you want to know more about Stone Peak, we made a video about them as well and their acquisition of Astound Broadband from TPG, which I'll link to above and below as well. Next is Brookfield Infrastructure, and they've been quite active in the digital infrastructure space as well. First, they acquired Brazilian data center provider Ascenti alongside Digital Realty for $1.8 billion. They also acquired a company they rebranded as Evoke, which were 31 data centers acquired through a sale and leaseback transaction with AT&T for $1.1 billion. Finally, Brookfield was also the initial bidder on the take private of Cincinnati Bell, which is a fiber provider, and Brookfield originally bid $2.6 billion before ultimately being beat out by another bidder. Next is I Squared Capital, which acquired the infrastructure division comprised mainly of fiber from publicly traded GTT Communications for $2.15 billion in October of 2020. We wrote an article about GTT Communications on our website, dgtlinfra.com, and if you want to check that article out, it's called GTT Communications Sells Infrastructure Division to I Squared for $2 billion. The next potential buyer is Macquarie Infrastructure. Macquarie acquired a company called Airtrunk, an Australian data center provider from Goldman Sachs and TPG Capital for $1.6 billion. Macquarie was also the winning bidder in the take private of Cincinnati Bell, a fiber provider, with a $3 billion bid beating out Brookfield, which we discussed earlier. Finally, the last infrastructure fund is EQT which acquired Zeo alongside Colony Capital for $14.3 billion in a transaction that closed in March of 2020. Further, EQT also acquired data center provider Edge Connects for $2.5 billion earlier in 2020. So now let's move to the bottom left and speak about some of the private equity funds, the third quadrant who could be potential buyers for Boingo Wireless. So in general, these funds are more generalist in nature, but have still invested in digital infrastructure companies as part of their strategy. So first, Blackstone. They were one of the bidders in the auction for Interaction, a European data center provider, which was ultimately sold to Digital Realty for $8.4 billion. Next is KKR, 
and KKR has been particularly active in digital infrastructure, but more specifically in Europe. And here, KKR acquired a 40% interest in a company called Telxius at a 3.7 billion euro valuation. And Telxius is Telefonica, which is a Spanish carrier. It's their infrastructure business for subsea cables and cellular towers. Further, KKR also acquired a company called Hyperoptic, which is a UK fiber to the home provider, which it spent 500 million pounds to buy. Finally, KKR acquired a 50% interest in a company called SFR Tower Co. at a 3.9 billion euro valuation, which comprised 10,200 tower sites across France and are all operated by French carrier Altice. Next is GI Partners, who in 2020 raised their inaugural digital infrastructure fund to focus on this space. And thus far this year, GI Partners has invested in a company called DR Fortress, which is a data center business in Hawaii, and they acquired Bluestream Fiber, a high-speed broadband provider in Florida. In the past, GI Partners has also had investments in Telex Group, a data center provider, Via West, a data center provider, and Wave Broadband, a fiber to the home provider. Next is Berkshire Partners, and they acquired a company called Terraco, a South African data center provider, for $1 billion. Berkshire Partners also owned a company called Light Tower Fiber Networks, which was a U.S. fiber provider, which was sold to Crown Castle for $7.2 billion and materially expanded Crown Castle's business in the fiber segment. Finally, Berkshire Partners also at one time owned Telex Group, a U.S. data center provider, which was sold to Digital Realty for $1.9 billion. Finally, the last private equity firm on the page is a company called Abri Partners. Abri has also owned a few digital infrastructure companies in the past, including European data center provider eShelter, which was sold to NTT Communications for $833 million. Abri Partners also owned a portion of Telex Group in partnership with Berkshire Partners, which we mentioned previously. The final and fourth quadrant of the potential buyers for Boingo is probably the least likely, but it's worth highlighting them as well because they are active in the space. And it includes Canadian pension funds such as Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, or CPPIB, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, which is another Canadian pension fund that owned Compass Data Centers, a U.S. and Canada data center provider, which was sold to Israeli Group for about $700 million. And Ontario Teachers also owned a company called Metronode, an Australian data center provider, which was sold to Equinix for $800 million. Finally, OMERS, or Ontario Municipal Employment Retirement System, is another Canadian pension fund. The other two on this page are sovereign wealth funds, specifically Singaporean sovereign wealth funds, notably GIC and Tomashik. GIC, for example, did a joint venture with Equinix to build out hyperscale facilities across Europe and Asia most recently. So hopefully you found this video on Boingo Wireless helpful. If you did, then please share it with somebody you think might also find it helpful. And consider subscribing to DGTL Infra. And visit us at dgtlinfra.com for more of the latest news on digital infrastructure. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like the video and post in the comments telling me who you think the potential buyer for Boingo Wireless may be. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.